So I've been asked to speak about um, health care, but um, I think I'm the only one on the panel who's run for office, uh, especially governor. And uh, that's the first time I met Dr. Eck when I ran for governor in 1997. And one of the nice things about running for governor is you get to meet a lot of interesting people. And you get a lot of good questions and uh, good comments. And the best question I got was from a student at the Eagleton Institute at Rutgers when I gave my talk about what would a free society look like in New Jersey? Well, we wouldn't have a $32 billion budget deficit. We wouldn't have a 50 to $100 billion unfunded liability. So the student asked me a question. Um, he said, Dr. Sabrin, uh, you say you're for limited government, personal responsibility, and free enterprise. What makes you different than a Republican? I said, I mean it. <laughs> and that's the problem we're facing in America today. A lot of people uh, talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. And that's the uh, reason um, we're here, uh, here today. Um, in preparing for today's remarks, I s Googled healthcare and government. And I said, how many hits could there be? 1,340,000,000 hits. And I read all of them. And it is just amazing how many articles there are about government and health care. And in a free society that I think we all would like to see in America, especially in health care, there would be no hits on government and health care, but the government would be out of it completely. And before we can diagnose the problem, we, uh, I should say before we can pr provide solutions, we have to diagnose the problem. And the problem really is several fold. And this is something that we as, especially I as an educator, and you as uh, physicians and educators, because you have to educate your patients on a lot of things. Uh, first of all, um, given what Andy Schlafly said and what the Supreme Court is now dealing with, uh, health care and government is totally unconstitutional. There is nothing, there's nothing in the Constitution that uh, talks about health care at all. I'm a naturalized citizen. I had to read the Constitution when I raised my right hand to become a U.S. citizen. I couldn't find anything about health care. And we're in a much different era. We're in a post-constitutional era. Years ago, when people wanted to do something that was not authorized by the Constitution, they amended the Constitution. When the Supreme Court ruled the income tax unconstitutional in the 1890s, they went to the drawing board and drew up the 16th Amendment. And they sold it to the American people that is a rich man's tax. Only 2% of the people would pay it. And that top rate would be 7%. So we know we can't trust the government to keep its words on the income tax. And we want, they wanted to prohibit alcohol. There was no authority to prohibit alcohol, so they went through the amendment to give us the uh, 18th Amendment. And of course, that worked out beautifully, didn't it? Uh, with the crime incorporated and what have you with, with um, the federal government. But more importantly, even when the government has the authorization to do something, it does it very poorly. And the, the example of that is the whole money issue that a famous doctor has been talking about for the past 40 years in Washington, D.C. They've outsourced that to the Federal Reserve, and that's one of the reasons we have a health care problem, is that everything's been inflated, especially health care and tuition, by the way. And so we know that we can't trust the government to do anything right. Uh, even when it comes to national defense, we no longer have national defense. What we have is the military-industrial complex. So an area after area where the government gets involved in, costs go up, prices go up, and quality goes down. And there's something more fundamental about, from the financial point of view, about healthcare that is the theme of my book that I'm currently writing called Ponzi Government. If you see the chart that I brought uh, to you today, this is a, a chart of projected Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security spending from now to 2080. Now, if you're a grandparent in this room, and if you know grandparents and great-grandparents, they should be screaming their heads off because their kids' taxes will have to double and triple to pay for all the unfunded liabilities of the federal government. That's already baked into the cake if nothing happens. In fact, um, Dr. Crisco mentioned a $100 trillion liability, underfunded liability. Well, he's 50% correct. According to Professor Kotlikoff of Boston University, the underfunded liability of the federal government is about $200 trillion. That means that uh, we're broke. We're beyond broke. And what that means is that uh, Medicare and Medicaid cannot continue the way it is. In fact, Medicare is, is I believe, in deficit now. It's running in, uh, it's a negative cash flow, as is Social Security. So in order to maintain these programs, the federal government must increase taxes 
dramatically or cut benefits. And that's the, the scary part, that government medical insurance is the great, one of the great moral hazards of our era. Because it says to people, you can engage in risky behavior and there's no consequences to that. And the, the, additionally, it, uh, government, government health insurance is based upon a, f a false actuarial premise. As Sheldon Richmond pointed out in the Freeman, the um, publication of the Foundation for Economic Education, the depth of the lack of understanding about insurance is on stark display whenever someone demands that the term of coverage for a sick person be the same as those for a healthy person. Risk grows out of uncertainty. But if someone is already sick, there is no uncertainty about his need for medical care. Insurance, in this case, would not be in real insurance, but rather a subsidy provided by others or prepayment for future expenses. To be actually, actuarially sound, insurance must discriminate, very bad thing in America today, on the basis of risk. If the government bars insurers from price discrimination, they really wouldn't be in the insurance business at all. It would be more accurate to call their activity a forced subsidy. We should at least call the thing what it is. So clearly, we have gone well beyond what the textbooks tell us and what uh, accountants do, which is what? Assess risk for us with uh, sound premiums. We don't have that any longer in the insurance business because of the government takeover of literally healthcare. And, and the dangerous thing we have about healthcare is, uh, Ludwig von Mises pointed this out many decades ago when he uh, spoke in the United States in the 1950s, the middle of the road leads to socialism. And we have a hybrid system, as we all know. We have private pay, uh, payers, we also have insurance, and then we have government involvement with Medicare and Medicaid. This is the perfect storm because the, the essence of the discussion is, well, we know the free market can't provide health care at an affordable price, therefore, what's the conclusion? Socialism, collectivism. And that is the problem we're facing today, is the welfare state and crony capitalism are, is the perfect storm in America today. In issue after issue, whether it's education, healthcare, energy, um, the money issue, um, infrastructure, it is well beyond the power of the government, as Dr. Crisco pointed out, to plan for society. It just doesn't work. So even if we're not ideologically bound to a free market, on a practical basis, we have to go up for the, fr for the free market, for the free enterprise system, which, by the way, has created more wealth in 200 years than the past, what, 200,000 years of human existence, and it's vilified by, by none other than, what, Nobel Prize winners in economics in, in the pages of the New York Times. So we have a real philosophical issue that we have to deal with, and that's one of the missions that I have as an academic, um, uh, I guess I'm one of the few PhDs in the room here, but I would not like to be a doctor today because you're essentially a government employee. Even though I'm in a, at a state college, the state support is dwindling to almost nothing. And um, could you imagine if uh, the President of the United States told my colleagues what we should teach in the classroom, how we should grade in the classroom, what type of exams we should give in the classroom? There would be screams from people across the political spectrum about the intrusion into academic freedom. Yet it's physicians that need to speak, step up to the plate and tell the, the uh, political elites, our classroom, our examining room is no different than a classroom. It is a sanctuary for what we do, which is to provide health care for our um, patients. And so, uh, how much time do we have? About a minute? Two, two, two minutes. Okay, let me just finish up by saying, uh, according to recent reports, one-third of the Medicare budget is wasted. There have been some recent raids by the FBI of uh, Medicare mills around the country, and as Tom DiLorenzo pointed out in his essay, Socialized Healthcare Versus the Law of Economics, every time government has got involved in, econo in healthcare, uh, the takeover has been astounding. For example, in 1910, 56% of all hospitals were privately owned, uh, we're down to 10%. So what we're seeing now is um, the, the co-opting, uh, co if you will, of health care by the government for the past hundred years. And it has continued. Just in my lifetime alone, in 1965, well, we remember when Medicare was, and Medicaid was uh, passed, and President Johnson and the rest of his team swore that 1990, the cost would be $3 billion a year. It would turn out to be $100 billion a year. So again, government constantly lowballs its what? Programs in order to get government support, for whether it's the income tax, the Federal Reserve, or any other uh, centralized planning institution. 
And we know that more money is not the answer. If that was the case, the children in Newark and Asbury Park would be geniuses since we're spending close to $30,000 a year on educating kids in um, the inner city. So what we have to do, quite frankly, is um, uh, do what I did, uh, which is uh, help found a nonprofit health center in Bergen County. You wouldn't think that Bergen County would need a nonprofit health center for the uninsured, but the data that we collected was about 80,000 uninsured in Bergen County, and many of them are in the, uh, under the poverty line in Southern County, and after years and years of planning, it finally opened up in 2009, the Bergen Volunteer Medical Initiative, BVMI, uh, patterned after the Volunteers in Medicine, which was started in Hilton Head, South Carolina by th Dr. Jack McConnell, who I spoke to uh, in the 1990s uh, in, during the Clinton administration, and if you recall, Cl the Clinton administration had a volunteer summit in Philadelphia, I think in the late ni 90s, and I said to Do uh, Jack, uh, Dr. McConnell, were you invited to speak at this facility, at this summit, because the main thrust of his facility was no government dollars, that it would be all volunteer efforts by physicians and nurses, and that uh, through donations, and he said no. Remember, this is the time Hillary Care was uh, in vogue, and that's the reason that I think we have this major problem. You have ideologically people like um, Hillary Clinton, John Corzine, and others who ideologically believe that government should run health care, and then you have crony capitalism. All the people that co get co-opted by the government because money is flowing from the government to the hospitals to all these clinics, and it's very easy to get co-opted, whether it's a $10 million uh, gift or a salary, but um, the moral hazard issue, I think, is the main one, because I could change everyone's behavior here tonight very easily. If I told you, you go to Atlantic City and you gamble your heart's content and I will make up your losses, what would be your incentive to do? Go to Atlantic City and try to hit the jackpot. Well, it's the same thing with health care. As the cu current governor of California, Jerry Brown, when he was a presidential candidate in 1976, said this, and I'll never forget this. He said, people eat too much, drink too much, smoke too much, then they want me to pay for their health care. And that, I think, is really the essence, is that personal responsibility has now taken a backseat to the entitlement philosophy and this uh, uh, welfare state mentality, which is very debilitating. The important point about uh, government involvement in medicine, it violates an important principle that this nation was founded on, freedom of conscience. We wouldn't have any debate over birth control pills or any other controversial aspect of medicine if government were involved. If you had to pay your own way, there'd be no conflict. And as, Tef as Thomas Jefferson so eloquently stated, to compel a man to furnish funds for the propagation of ideas he abhors is sinful and tyrannical. That should be over everyone's door on their desk because I think that's the essence of America, the, the ability to worship or not worship, to believe something without infringing on someone else is I think what the essence of uh, America is all about. Let me conclude by saying quality health care, like all good things in life, comes from voluntary choice and freedom. We need to separate uh, government and health care once and for all so we can finally have the motto of the state of New Jersey um, implemented. That is liberty and prosperity. Thank you.